is in deep social, economic, financial, and political trouble. Everything seemed to be collapsing around us as a result of incompetence and grand corruption displayed and demonstrated over the last eight years by this rowley led administration. Crime, especially murders, is on and not only on the rise, but out of control. The economy is in a mess. Business confidence is plunging. Labor has been pulverized and pauperized under this administration. Not to mention the trade unions that have been subverted and literally undermined. This morning, we say the time has come for the people of this country, the workers of this country, the trade unions of this country, the business community to stand up and take note of what is happening in our beloved republic. So today we have with us the Honorable Rushton Parry, MP for Mayaro, and our shadow minister in the shadow cabinet with responsibility for trade and industry. The Honorable Rushton Parry will address some of the burning issues affecting micro, small and medium-sized businesses, among other issues. I would later address issues surrounding the labor market and labor as a whole, and why labor has been placed in a place where the government has taken steps to not only weaken subvert and to literally undermine its operations, but it has gone a step further by creating contract labor, which is like a slave zone that they have established in TNT. These are matters that we intend to prosecute and to bring to your attention, as well as recommendations that the UNC has to address these issues. So without much further ado, may I take this opportunity to invite the Honorable Rushton Parry to address you at this time. Rushton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Senator Mark, and a very good morning to all our viewers and listeners in this opposition uh, press briefing this morning. I'd like to start my deliberation with a very broad statement that the Minister of Finance and the Honorable Prime Minister, while they are entitled to their own opinion, they are not entitled to their own facts. Now the budget debate has ended and after hours of presentation from the ruling PNM, the people of Trinidad and Tobago still does not have a clear and precise idea of what this government intends to do to make their lives better. This morning, I wish to use this opportunity to directly address some key matters which was raised by Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley, who as head, as head of government should have really done a better job at allaying the fears of the citizens at this time. Instead, Prime Minister Rowley took the opportunity on Wednesday to once again gaslight the population, trying to paint a picture that everything is well in Trinidad and Tobago, which is fine, even great under his tenureship. But sadly, ladies and gentlemen, the people of this nation does not accept that. 
their experience is far, far different from what the Honorable Prime Minister attempted to project in his budget debate. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, there are thousands of families in this nation who are struggling to put food on their table, to pay their bills, to find a job, to send their children to school, to run their small businesses. And the Prime Minister came to Parliament and he basically told the nation that this was the best budget ever. And if you don't like it, well, too bad for you. That is what he said. Dr. Rowley, the least you could have done in your presentation was to address the thousands of people in Mayaro and across the country who now can't even get a proper supply of pipe-borne water. Say something, say anything to reassure the population that your government is at least aware that we currently have a water crisis in this country. But you did not do that. In fact, Wasa has issued another warning to the population that De Salcott is once again going to be shutting down for about nine days. And when De Salcott goes down, the, the water situation in Central and Southwest, Southwest Trinidad becomes unbearable. But Mr. Prime Minister, we have an even worse crisis than the water crisis in this country, and that is of crime. Under this government, in 2024, I am sure you may not get water in your house, but I'm almost sure that you will get a bandit or two based on the operations of your government. Crime is flowing more than water today in this country. Last year, we recorded almost 600 murders in Trinidad and Tobago. This is a tragic, frightening, shameful record, which we are on track to beat this year. Worse still, ladies and gentlemen, brazen home invasions are now a daily occurrence in our land. And I have been informed that many home invasions that are happening where there have been sexual assault of female victims, those home invasions go unreported because of the embarrassment to the families involved. That is the nature of our situation today in Trinidad and Tobago. Yet, Prime Minister, in your budget presentation, you offered no plan, no vision, no hope to the people of this country who are being terrorized by the crim criminal element in this country. I want to remind Dr. Rowley that he is both Prime Minister and he is head of the National Security Council. And Prime Minister, your first duty to the people of this country is to keep all of them safe. The role of Prime Minister is to lead the nation and to find ways out of any situations that we find ourselves in and chart a way forward for the citizens of our country. Real leadership is about fixing problems. It is not looking to blame others, to fix blame on. I want to speak this morning about some very interesting statements made by the Prime Minister in his presentation. This has to do with the dismissal of my remarks regarding the government's following of IMS prescriptions. I can tell you that his claim was untrue. I have the Article 4 report right here before me. This is the May 2023 Article 4 report that was submitted to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, this report is written in English and it's available online for everyone to have access to. Now, the Prime Minister was extremely upset that in my budget contribution, I said that the PNM were following IMF recommendations. Now, Dr. Rowley in the past, and he loves to tell the nation that his government is saving this country. 
and to use his word, saving this country from the doors of the IMF. Well, I can tell you, Dr. Rowley may not be opening the door of the IMF just yet, but certainly he looks like he's ringing the front bell. So what is this IMF Article 4 report about? Under Article 4 of the IMF Articles of Agreement, the IMF holds bilateral discussions with members of the government, of central bank, and it's done on an annual basis. The staff team visits the country for about seven or eight days, I think. They collect economic and financial information, and then they discuss the country's economic developments and policies. Now, when they return to Washington, the staff presents a report, and it forms the basis of discussion by an executive board. So if you were to turn to page 14, there's a section of this report that is entitled Policy Discussions. Now, under Policy Discussions, I would just like to read a paragraph for you. And I quote, Revenue mobilization could be further enhanced by securing the operationalization of ongoing fiscal reforms, including the Revenue Authority, the Gambling Bill, and the Property Tax. Does any of those three things sound familiar to the people of Trinidad and Tobago? These are policy discussions that the IMF is, is engaging with our technocrats. Huh? If you were to turn to page 18, this is what page 18, a paragraph says. Staff, which is the IMF staff, they welcome the authority's proposal to increase the retirement age by five years to 65 years. This will support the sustainability of the system and pension adequacy. Other measures, such as gradually increasing the contribution rate, could also be considered. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Let's turn to page 19. On page 19, the authorities indicated that the electricity and water tariff reform is advancing and the rationalization of transfers and subsidies to SOEs and other public bodies would yield significant savings. Now, is that familiar to anybody in this country? So when I raise these matters during the budget debate, I indicated that we, although we, did not, we have not signed up to the IMF on the dotted line, we're knocking at their doors. And the real question is, why have we gotten here? Why have we gotten here to the point where we have to be hovering and orbiting around some of these discussions in the IMF? Well, it is simple. For eight years, this government has refused to take sound advice. They, they dismantled their own economic advisory board. Dismantled it because they don't like what they have to say. And more recently, there was the formulation of this roadmap, roadmap to recovery report. Now, anybody asks, where is that report? The last I heard of it, it was in a garbage bin somewhere on Frederick Street. So on one hand, Dr. Rowley is praising himself, saying that he's saving us from the IMF. And on the other hand, he's creating the TTRA, implanting property tax, the gambling bill, and he's restructuring WASA and Tiantec, all the things that came up in the IMF discussion. So what was Dr. Rowley's position in making the claim that it was untrue? What it tells me, ladies and gentlemen, is that Dr. Rowley is telling this nation that he's not listening to the IMF, He's just doing everything they say to do. Just like when Dr. Rowley told this country he was not closing Petra Trin, he just sending home all the workers permanently. This IMF report, ladies and gentlemen, 
It's called the 2023 Article for Consultation Press Relief and Staff Report. It is available online. You can download it. It is written in English. I urge everyone to take a read. Because clearly, the government led by Dr. Keith Rowley is hoping that nobody reads it. I have to say that I am genuinely disturbed by how much, how out of touch, I must say with the reality, that the Prime Minister and his government appears to be. And I sincerely mean that. Because it is the people of Trinidad and Tobago who unfortunately must bear the brunt of his government's retreat from the reality of our position. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance has the comfort to live in their own delusion. But the people of our nation must deal with the harsh reality of their failures every day. Budget 2024 was clearly a missed opportunity by the government. As I stated in my budget contribution, I found the budget 2024 to be wasted in terms of the conversation or the policy direction that the government could have made as an agreement with the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I made the statement that budget 2024 could have been summed up as a national surrender. This government has surrendered. They have no plan to fight crime and they had definitely no plan to increase economic growth over the short, medium, and long term. There are three items that I want to deal with specifically. First, it is this questionable unemployment rate of 3.7%. It was quite startling to hear the Minister of Finance say that we currently have an un unemployment rate of 3.7%. Now there's an old saying, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. And I would really love the Minister of Finance to provide the methodology of how that number of 3.7% was arrived at. Now he went on to praise the CSO for putting this data together. Now I wonder if this is the same CSO that he chastised and malaligned in 2015, 2016 with all the inefficiencies of that office. Is that the same CSO that he's relying on for this data? Now I am asking this question because in recent months, we have seen literally thousands of people line up for hours to apply for jobs on a cruise ship to get out of Trinidad and Tobago. More recently, we saw thousands of young people literally cause traffic jam on the highway while applying for a few jobs at prisons. We also know that thousands of small and medium-sized businesses had to permanent, permanently shut down in 2020. Yet, we are being told that the unemployment is at an almost record low. That is personally baffling to me. As this budget, the government has announced, on the other hand, of restarting what they now call the food box program. So on one hand, the government is saying the economy is thriving, 3.7% unemployment. But on the other hand, they are saying that they're giving out more grants for the vulnerable because it is needed. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot be in the two states at the same time. Both items cannot be true at the same time. Either more people are working or there is a significant amount of people out of work who need help and assistance. That is why I am saying we need to see a proper detailed analysis of the unemployment rate. So let me ask a few questions if the minister stands on this 3.7% unemployment. What is the unemployment rate of our UE and UTT graduates today? 
what is the unemployment rate of people living in rural communities like Mayaro, Toko, Maruga? What is the unemployment rate of young men in urban centers? What is the unemployment rate of single mothers in urban and rural areas? What percentage of those employed on short-term contracts or non-sustainable jobs? Ladies and gentlemen, I ask those questions because we seek answers. When you are running a business and you have to plan for future growth and development, you must take the truth into account. The status of your environment, the data must be sound for you to make sound decisions. That is absent by this government. And they continue to use the privilege of parliament to peddle falsehoods. The other area that I want to touch briefly on is on a statement that the Minister of Finance made concerning the People's Partnership and the fact that between 2010 and 2015, we did nothing to deal with the minimum wage. I want to put it on record, and I know Senator Mark will discuss it in some more details. The People's Partnership dealt with the minimum wage on two occasions during their term of office. The first occasion, there was a change to the minimum wage on the 10th of December 2010 via legal notice 291, and I have it here in my hand. So as soon as we assumed office in 2010, the minimum wage was dealt with. And there was a second time that we looked at the minimum wage based on the preva prevailing economic circumstance of the country. This was done on the 19th of September, 2014, via legal notice 402. I have a copy in my hand here. These documents are available on the parliamentary website. It can be downloaded easily. Now, this minimum wage which was presented in the budget, this was really the only achievement, I believe, that the government could have boasted about in terms of raising the minimum wage to bring an, an additional $3 per hour into the pockets of our citizens. While it is a welcome move, we have to view it in a larger perspective. And this is the perspective I want you to take it into consideration. The government can increase the minimum wage to $100. It would be meaningless if there are no jobs in the first place. So you could raise the minimum wage to what you want, but if those at the lowest end of the employment cycle cannot find a job, well, then it makes no sense to them. It's not going to help them in any way. But that is what the people of Trinidad and Tobago wanted to hear about. What are your plans to grow the economy with the ultimate goal of creating jobs. Every single person wants to have a job to be a productive member of our society. Increasing the minimum wage will not help people if jobs are hard to come by. If businesses continue to shut down because of crime, the lack of foreign exchange, the stifling of the provision of VAT refunds, that is not going to help anybody with any type of minimum wage. Those are the problems, ladies and gentlemen, that the government is refusing to deal with. So while the government wants to boast about increasing the minimum wage, they are actually killing businesses with their incompetence and poor policy decision. The next item that I want to talk about, and I think is the most serious, serious provision in the budget of 2024. And in my contribution, I called on the Minister of Finance to answer the question when he wrapped up. He did not. So I want to put it out here into the media. 
it's an issue which to me raises very serious questions in terms of the government's announcement to what they call their intent to repatriate foreign currency. Now, I want to quote to all of you listening and tuning from page 37 of the budget statement. And I read, we intend, which is the key to Rowley's administration, to move aggressively. Now, aggressively means quickly and harsh to develop strategies to increase the repatriation of foreign exchange earned overseas by local and foreign businesses operating in Trinidad and Tobago, as this is key to an increased local supply of foreign exchange. I ask the minister to please explain exactly what that means. What on earth does that mean? The fact is that if the Minister of Finance could insert such a policy into a budget statement with no clear explanation of what he means, it really sums up the level of arrogance and recklessness of this Rowley regime. Now, there is only one way that any reasonable, sane person could interpret what the minister has said that he plans to aggressively do. The minister of finance appears to be saying that he intends to implement state controls on capital movement. That is the only logical way to make sense of what he said. Remember, this is the same government who keeps telling the nation that we do not have a forex crisis. This is the same government who is telling us that we have foreign investors flocking to our shores. They keep harping that we are the best investment grade country in the Caribbean. Well, if that is so, where are our investors? Why is there still only two foreign partners in the Phoenix Park um, processing zone? Where are them? Now, by virtue of the statement in the minister's budget speech, are they threatening to implement capital controls on local and foreign business? This is pure madness. It has been 30 years since the floating of the Trinidad and Tobago dollar. And all capital movement controls were eliminated in Trinidad and Tobago. This government wants to take us back to the bad days of the 1980s under the PNM when it implemented stringent capital controls like the EC0 and the EC1 schemes in an attempt to control the flow of US dollars out of the country. For all of you would have been paying attention 30 years ago. These schemes were abject failures and contributed to the rapid loss of our foreign currency reserve. Now the government has already, by their own accord, made a mess of the distribution of Forex. While many small and medium-sized businesses are on the brink of closure because they can't get the Forex they need now, they now seemingly want to create more chaos by instructing businesses and individuals on where they can keep their own money. Implementing capital controls resembles a similar thinking as those criminals who invade people's home. If they see that your business has Forex and your foreign vendors or your foreign customers are sending Forex to your account, then perhaps they want to move like those criminals and take your money from you and tell you what to do with it. All I'm asking is that the Minister of Finance the government must come clear on what they mean by foreign exchange repatriation and what is this aggressive move that the minister and his government wants to put on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And this is not only for local businesses. Huh? This is for both foreign and local entities doing business in Trinidad and Tobago. The repatriation of foreign currency will serve as a major disincentive to foreign investors and dramatically hinder 
local as well as international businesses wanting to operate here in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, what is even more strange is that I have not heard the business chambers, any of the business operations, they have not rung an alarm bell on this. Now, I do not know if the government has communicated with them privately and it has not been placed in the media. So I'm calling on Minister Imbert at his soonest to come out and tell the public, tell the business community, tell our foreign business um, partners here in Trinidad and Tobago, what do you mean by forex repatriation? Again, these are issues that I feel that the government must come clean on as we attempt to realign as we attempt to restructure and replace Trinidad and Tobago back on a trajectory of growth. And while we're on the topic of growth, there was much ado about the 2.1% projected growth this year, another 31 next year. But while our growth is good, when the Minister of Trade spoke, she outlined the growth in various sectors. But if you looked at the data that she presented, it was from 2020 to 2023. Now, one would expect any economy that went to sleep because of the pandemic, when they woke up, you would experience some growth. So there was nothing concerning great policy positions by the government that caused that. It was just simply these industries woke up and they started to produce once again. But take a look at the overall picture. From 2015 to 2023, the Trinidad and Tobago economy has shrunk by 17.5%. Now, Minister Imbert, in his closing, he boasted that he grew this economy from $150 billion in 2015 to $190 billion today. But he didn't say it, it's, it's, it's what you call nominal GDP. If I were to break that down for you, if you are selling a doubles today for $5, and next year we sell it for $10, then that is not real growth. We've just increased prices. So what you found that the prices have increased on goods and services, our production has increased based on prices. So we really did not grow. It was strictly based on price increases. So Minister Imbert is really pushing and peddling data that does nothing for us to realign our economy back onto a project, a, 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 a part of growth and development in this country. They continue to use the privilege of parliament to peddle on truths, to sell their own version of the truth, their own version of statistics. Now in closing, I want to repeat the point that I made in my budget presentation. Over the past eight years, this government has developed the unfortunate habit of calling anyone who disagrees with them unpatriotic. When the members of the opposition ex express genuine concerns over government policy, they're accused of wanting this government to fail. But let me say this today again, as a patriot of Trinidad and Tobago, none of us in the opposition, on the opposition benches, wants our nation to fail. My children, as well as, as well as the children of our colleagues in government, all have to live in this country together. When this government fails, it means our country fails. It means that the dreams of all our children fail. The opposition, as a loyal opposition, we will continue day after day to question this government and raise our concerns where we see it. Not because we want the government to fail, but because we want the tr children of Trinidad and Tobago to succeed. I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and I will be prepared to answer any questions at the end of this briefing. So I'll now pass it back over to Senator Mark. Yes, thank you very much, my colleague, the Honorable Rushton Parry. Members of the media, I would like to make a few remarks on what I would like to address to you this morning in respect of what is called the state of the labor 
market and the state of labor in that particular framework. Now, the labor market is crucial because that is where employers and labor meet so that prices could be determined in terms of wages for their engagement. The market is crucial for employment generation, increase in production, productivity, and ultimately workers' quality of life and standard of living. My colleague raised the issue of the boss by the Minister of Finance of an unemployment rate of 3.7% and asked the minister to produce the methodology used by the CSO to arrive at this figure because in any developing or developed economy, a 3.7% unemployment rate is considered to be full employment in any economy. So what the Minister of Finance is telling us is that Trinidad and Tobago is experiencing full employment. I want to ask members of the media to look at this, the review of the economy. And I want to turn you, your attention to what is called Appendix, it is Appendix 13 of this document, which deals with the issue of population, labor force, and employment. This is the actual appendix. And what do we see in this Appendix 13? What do we see? We have a concept called non-institutional population made up of persons 15 years and over. The over really means 64 years. So between 15 years and 64 years. Now the population of Trinidad and Tobago provisionally as at the end of 2022 so that 1,365,805 persons. When you take out children and the elderly and the retirees, you have what is called an institutional or a non-institutional population of 1,081,400 persons. The labor force is according to what I have before me, 602,500. And an employed population of 576,700. Given us, according to the minister, according to the information, an unemployment of 25,800. Now, as we go further down, we see something, a concept called labor force participation rate. And what does that indicate to us? It indicates that you have to look at your labor force and your, your non-institutional population to get or to arrive at your labor force participation rate. And what we have seen is that from 2017 right up to 2022, the average is about 55% or thereabouts. So we have a labor force participation rate of 55% in our country. Minus your labor force from your non-institutional population of 1,081,000. What do you get? 
you get some 478,000 citizens who are able to work, who want to work, and they cannot find work. So it is important to understand that when we talk about the labor market and we talk about the labor force participation rate, we have a crisis in our nation where there is in fact over 478,000 persons who should be in the labor force, who should be in the labor market, but they are not anywhere near there. The question is, where are these persons? Are these persons joining gangs? The 478,000 persons? Because you have young people in that number. Are these people staying at home to take care of their families? These are issues that the government has not addressed, but is very important in looking at the unemployment rate in Trinidad and Tobago. The other area I want to look at very briefly is what is called the, uh, the weakness, or I should say, the reduction or the demise in what is called workers' protection mechanisms in Trinidad and Tobago. And what we have seen is that workers' protection has deteriorated in Trinidad and Tobago. And we have to look at it from two perspectives. One, labor has been weakened and has become insecure because of what the government has introduced, not now, but several years, as labor contract, fixed labor contracts. So what you have, for example, in the public service, that is the civil service specifically, we have an establishment of 33,000 positions. We have close to 16,000 vacancies. Only 14,000 permanently secured workers exist in the civil service today. But you know what, members of the media? There are over 16,000 contract workers in the civil service today. And most of these workers in that 16,000 grouping are on short-term fixed contracts. Talking about three months, six months, sometimes a year. How can you have 16,000 workers employed on short-term fixed contracts? What kind of security are these workers going to be experiencing? So you have a crisis existing in Trinidad and Tobago where workers in the civil service are engaged, as I said, on short-term contracts. And that is causing no end of job insecurity for workers where workers cannot even access short-term loans, where they cannot engage in any long-term activities as it relates to mortgages, to buy a home, because they are all fixed on short-term contracts in the civil service. That also extends to the state enterprise sector where workers are abused, brutalized, because of the short-term fixed contract arrangement. That is cause for serious concern. Because what it does, it allows those workers 
who are on short-term contracts to pay their NIS contributions. But at the same time, the workers are not entitled to NIS benefits because they have to work for more than 12 months to access benefits, whether it's a funeral grant or whether it's, let's say, any kind of access to women who might be pregnant and they need to access NIS benefits. So the government is contributing to the undermining of the national insurance system in Trinidad and Tobago through their employment policies. Members of the media never forget that when they close on Petrotrin, of dollars. The government needs to bring their payments of NIS through their various state enterprises and directly up to speed. But you know what the government chooses to do, members of the media? The government, in collaboration with the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, in collaboration with the board of the NIB, have collaborated to do what? One, increase contribution rates. Government is closing down enterprises, placing thousands of people on the breadline, and that is contributing negatively to what is called NIS contributions. So it happened at Petrotrain. Thousands of persons have been retrenched, terminated. NIS discontinued. They retrenched two sets of workers in two periods at TSTT, amounting to 800 NIS contribution decreased. They have done the same thing at TITCO, at UTT. And the latest members of the media is this. This is what is happening to the NI system. system. The government, the government has, reduced has reduced its contributions, its contributions in the 2024 estimate of expenditure, estimate of expenditure towards, WASA towards WASA from $64 million, million to $25 million. million. That is going to have, a, going to devastated have a devastating impact, impact on the national, on the national insurance, insurance system. system. And it is and here, it is here for all to for see. For all to see. So, me so members of the media, we, we are seeing where, again, 
in an article in the Express, in the Guardian, Sunday, October the 1st, 2023, where we are seeing NIB proposes rate increase to government to fund billion dollar gap. Look at here. Sunday Guardian. So what is happening, members of the media, is that the government of Trinidad and Tobago is deliberately, calculatedly terminating jobs at Petrotrain, jobs at TSTT, jobs at WASA, jobs at UTT, jobs at TITCO, and reducing the contributions to the NIS, thereby undermining the very system that is required for sustainability and stability. Members of the media, if you are not aware, let me bring to your attention a stark reality. The government, the International Monetary Fund, and the board of the NIB in 2018 agreed to reduce your $3,000 pension when you reach the age of 60 years by 6%. I want to repeat, the government and the International Monetary Fund through the NIB board has agreed to reduce the NIS minimum pension by 6% annually if you take your NIS at the age of 60 years. If you take your NIS at the age of 60 years under their scheme, you will get 6% less 3,000. If you take it at 61, you will get 6% less. If you take it at 62, you will get 6% less. If you take it at 63, it is the same 6% and 64. The only time you will not receive or have a reduction in your NIS minimum pension of 3,000 is if you take it at the age of 65. I think workers have to understand and the people who contribute to the NIS needs to, need to appreciate what is at stake. The government along with the International Monetary Fund is seeking to place NIS minimum pension at 80% of the minimum wage in Trinidad and Tobago. 80%. So we have to understand and fully appreciate what this is about. So when we have these reductions in NIS contributions, it would make you poorer. And mind you, you would have met your 750 contributions, which is the minimum you are required in order to access your pension at the age of 60 years. So you qualify, you have the right to access your pension, but the government and the IMF is saying, listen, if you have to access your pension at 60 years, you have to do it at a reduction of 6%. So I think this is a very important matter that we have to pay attention to. And finally, let me address, as my colleague did earlier, 
this question of the minimum wage. Members of the media, you may not be aware, but it was under the Bastio Pande government in 2000 that the national minimum wage orders were introduced. I want to repeat, it was in 2000 for the first time the concept of a national minimum wage was established in Trinidad and Tobago. Prior to that national minimum wage being established in Trinidad and Tobago, what did we have? We had what was called sectorial orders. So if you work in the retail outlet as a shop assistant, you would get what is called a shop, a sectorial order. If you work in the petrol in, um, sector, you will get a order, a sectorial order for petrol workers, for workers in the hotel and catering business, for security officers. It was Basdio Pande and the UNC in, 20, in 2000 that introduced for the first time a national minimum wage. You know what a national minimum wage means? It means that all workers who are not represented by a trade union would be entitled to receive a national minimum wage. Anywhere you work in Trinidad and Tobago, the minimum wage would be applied to you. That is the national minimum wage. And I just want to say that under the People's Partnership Administration, in, f in a five-year term, we increased the national minimum wage by 66%. In 2011, we inherited a $9 minimum wage from the Patrick Manning Gov um, Administration. And we increased that to $12.50 by 2011. And by 2014 into 2015, that went to $15 per hour, representing a 66% increase. Whereas when you go to the Manning Administration, we are talking about these fellas increasing the minimum wage by $1. They increased the minimum wage by, by $1 on two occasions. And the total percentage in that period, 2002 to 2007, was between 6 and 8%. That was when these fellas were swimming in wealth during that period. But they only increased the minimum wage by a measly, miserly 6%. So I raised these points. To, to, in, to inform the media that workers are under severe stress in Trinidad and Tobago. The trade union movement, unions in this country, are under severe stress in this country. Back in 10, 15 years ago, organized labor represented 15% of the labor force in this country. You know today, it could be less than 10%. So 90% of the workers of this country have no trade union representation. And they depend on the minimum wage, which is the national minimum wage, to see them through. And this is why members of the media, the United National Congress has given the undertaking that when it returns to office as a government, we are going to be committed and we are committing ourselves to the following policies subject to consultation with the parties. One, we are going, a UNC government commits itself to ensuring that the following broad policy positions are enacted. One, the repealing and replacing of the Industrial Relations Act. 
the repealing and replacing of the outdated Severance and Benefits Act. The simplification of the registration process for trade unions. Incentivizing the trade union movement to encourage workers to become financial members of trade unions. And we are going to ensure that there's a greater recognition um, and space for the role of trade unions in promoting income and wealth inequality in our society through the free collective bargaining process. And of course, the resolution of all collective agreements in the public sector. These are some of the commitments that we have made and we will, in fact, commit ourselves to in a new administration. In closing, let me remind workers, the PNM is not your friend. The PNM is dismantling, decimating, and destroying workers in Trinidad and Tobago and trade unions. We call on the workers of our country. We call on the WASA workers. We call on the workers of Trinidad and Tobago and their unions to stand up, stand up, and take a clear position in defense of your interests and in defense of your rights. The PNM in the last seven years has pauperized, brutalized in a most callous way the workers of our land, whether they belong to the middle strata, whether they are in the minimum wages sector. Workers are under severe stress to make two ends meet in Trinidad and Tobago. And to make it even worse, the government has intensified the engagement of workers on fixed short-term contracts, which is really like a reintroduction of slavery in Trinidad and Tobago. When you are on a short-term contract for three months, six months, and a year, what kind of job security do you have? What kind of protection does the worker have? What kinds of engagement you can have with your credit union, with your bankers? If you want to start a family, how are you going to engage in mortgage payment? But that is what the PNM has done and what the PNM has been doing. So members of the media, these are some of the areas we would like to address this morning as it relates to the labor market and the state of play of the labor, of labor and workers in Trinidad and Tobago. So I pause at this time and open the floor and the conference to the media for any questions, any clarifications they would like to have from both the Honorable Rushton Pare and myself. So the floor is now open to the media for any questions you may wish to pose at this time. Good morning. Um, so happy to see that the boycott of the Guardian is over. Still <laughs> silly But uh, you mentioned WASA and the um, possible retrenchment coming to WASA. The WASA would tell you in response that they are overstaffed and that level of staffing is not sustainable in the years to come. What would your response to that be? It's simple. You have th three unions engaged here. You have the EPA, the Estate Police Association. You have the NUGFW, and you have the Public Services Association. Collective bargaining means that if there are disputes, if there are areas of interest that the employer wishes to raise with the unions concerning the staff, their employees, or the workers. What do you do, Akash? You meet with the union, you treat with the issue, and you seek to find common grounds. You do not impose your will on the people. So yes, if you are claiming there is an overstaffing problem, because my information, there are some 5,000 workers 
currently employed at WASA. If they are claiming there is overstaff of the workforce at WASA, do what the collective bargaining process tells you to do. Meet and treat with the unions. And the unions will, in fact, engage you. And there will be some resolution at the end of the day. But you do not introduce. And this is the most unsavory cut of all. Would you believe that the Minister of Finance spoke for four hours and seven minutes? The Public Utilities Minister spoke for 55 minutes during the budget debate. The Prime Minister spoke for 55 minutes and not on one occasion did the Prime Minister did the Prime Minister tell Trinidad and Tobago that this was coming. It took the UNC through the alertness of the MP for Princess Town to go through the sub items and notice that the NIS contribution, which was in 2022, 2023, 64 million dollars. They estimated for 2024 at 25 million, some hundred thousand. So you thought they tried to slip it in? They tried to slip it in, Akash, without informing the unions. The, I haven't heard a statement from none of the unions thus far. So they have been caught flat-footed as it relates to the intention of the government. Nobody can argue that if you have an overstaffing problem, you cannot address it. But address it properly, not by stealth, not through secrecy, not by stabbing the workers in their backs, not by engaging the trade unions who represent their interests. And this is a criminal act on the part of the administration. They knew what they were doing, but they were hoping that it would have slipped us and we would not have discovered it. We discovered it, we exposed it, and I'm happy that you were able to publish it. So that the whole of Trinidad and Tobago would be aware of what the intentions of the government is. I don't think the unions have been completely unaware that that was coming, considering they, they knew that a mandate was given for there to be a transformational plan. Now what WASA is saying is that transformational plan should be ready by month's end, and then they will go to the union. I think what the union is saying is that they would have preferred to be part of that consultation before the plan was finalized. But Praka, um, Akash, sorry, I call you Prakash. Akash. Akash, we live in the 21st century. We are signatories to the ILO. The ILO of conventions that deals with these matters, that deal with these matters rather. You have to consult with people before you take these actions. The unions are not begging for consultation. They are entitled to be part of the consultative process. If you are going to retrench people, if you say that your staff, the staffing levels is above what is required, if you have a restructuring plan, that must be part of a discussion with the relevant unions so that when your plan is finally announced, you have buy-in the unions, the employer. Now, not everything will go honky-dory. And if it does not go properly, then you can go to the courts, the industrial court, or you can take action. But the important thing is that you consult with the workers and their representatives before you take action. So you have a restructuring plan, and the workers have never seen that plan. The plan, according to Minister Marvin Gonzalez, has been approved by the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago. So when is the union and the workers going to see this plan, as you said? Only when they come to them in a week's time or a month's time or six weeks time that is unacceptable 
that is unacceptable, it is indefensible, it is inexcusable, as far as we are concerned. Yesterday, the, um, the Prime Minister would have opened the um, Archibald really on Highway in 2014, and um, during his, his, his presentation his address, uh, he spent a considerable portion of time talking to me, in critical of your administration, handling of that project, saying that your actions uh, is leaving the country in a position where it can still be liable for about $1 billion. Yes. No, li um, listen, as far as we are concerned, the, the government has been talking about this matter for years now, since 2010. I just want to remind you that the government has been making allegations, allegations, allegations. If the government has proof of what it is talking about, let the government take action. The government is talking, alleging, making all kinds of allegations, imputations. Let them take the matter to the relevant authorities. Let the matter be prosecuted. If you said I did something wrong, take me to the court. Stop making allegations. They are about to call a general elections, you know. Elections can be called in 2024. So Donna Cox goes to Parliament and she accuses the MP for Shagonas East of some kinds of some kind of activity involving food cards. But she doesn't do that outside of Parliament, you know, Akash. She does it in Parliament. So it is allegations allegations i am saying to dr rowley if you believe what you have said take action and stop crying like a cry cry baby that is what he's doing elections are around the corner and these are issues that he's raising to build his profile i want to tell you prakash akash the pnm is a minority government in Tobago. Read the THA. The PNM is a minority government in Trinidad via the local government elections. This is a minority government waiting in the departure launch to leave. And the people are calling on them to call elections now. My final question uh, deals with something the what will be our front page today. Uh, have you all heard anything from Dr. Rowley since, I know it was just yesterday, today with respect to his attendance to that proposed crime talks? And do you believe that the longer it drags on, the more the, it, it loses it, it, its verve, its fire, what people were hoping to, to achieve? And will there be a position where, do you think the opposition might reach a point where it, said, where it says, listen, taking too long, let's not bother them. Listen, you see this? We have faith in the people. We know that the people are under siege by the criminals in our country. We know that we are heading for more than 605 murders as at the end of the 31st of December, 2023. So our political leader and leader of the opposition is committed to meeting and treating with the crime wave in our nation. That is why we have asked for clarification. Because the Prime Minister seems to be shifting the goalposts from one spot to another when it suits his interests and fancies. We have sought clarification from him on a number of issues. Akash you, Akash, you remember when we got the first letter from Dr. Rowley? He suggested that we have four persons from the opposition, four persons from the government, just four members. He comes in his latest letter on the 12th of October and said, you know what? They must all be parliamentarians. So he moved from members to parliamentarians. And not only that, he unilaterally increases his number from, from four 
to five and leaves our number at four and saying, listen, if you want to bring any stakeholder into these discussions as part of your delegation, you, leader of the opposition, and your team must get a vote on that. And if the majority says, no, you cannot bring Gary Griffith as an advisor. You cannot bring criminologists from UWE as advisors. You cannot bring NGOs with you. You know why? Because I have five members and you have four. And he's saying in his letter to the honorable leader of the opposition that a vote has to be taken on that to determine the way forward. Do you think he's trying to frustrate you or to pull off the entire thing? I do not know what his intentions are. All I can tell you is that the United National Congress, under the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, is committed because we know crime is a national emergency in Trinidad and Tobago. Prakash, as, Akash, rather, as we speak here, Somebody, daughter, son, mother, sister, could be murdered, could be raped. So we are seeing crime. We are seeing crime as a serious matter. So we are committed to ensuring that we have a meeting of the minds. And whatever it takes, how long it takes, it does not matter. We will continue to pursue in the interest of the people collaboration with the government with a view to addressing the crime scourge in Trinidad and Tobago. Any other question, members? We have one question from Julie Brown to MP Parry. Has MP Parry communicated with or met with the Public Utilities Minister with regard to the water supply shortage in his constituency? And if so, what has been the response? So, since 2015, we've been having severe water issues, and I have been having conversations with both uh, the minister in, in, in that parliament, uh, that was Senator um, Lehand, and it continued with this new minister of public utilities as well. Um, two years ago, we met. We did meet as a team, Wasa, myself, and the minister in Mayaro. And we discussed several medium-term to long-term engineering solutions that would have dealt with the water distribution issues in the constituency. Uh, where we've reached is that none of these medium or long-term projects have um, gotten off the ground as yet. And that is why um, you know, I, I insisted during the parliamentary debate and even at the Standing Finance Committee that the minister do whatever it takes to get cabinet to approve the money to do these three projects that would raise one, the volume of water that is coming into the constituency, and two, deal with the engineering issues of having to move a lot of water from the Navet Dam into the Miaro constituencies, which, which you have, it's the outer limits, the outer end of the infrastructure. So we continue to work, I as MP continue to work with the minister and um, work with WASA to, you know, try and out the short-term fires while they produce and, and try to get the projects going for the medium and long-term solution for the constituency. Um, Prakash, um, Akash, rather, Samaru, I would like to leave a piece of correspondence with you. And it deals with this matter is about the highway. May I remind your good self and the media that this entire project, including packages for this project, were pre-approved before the UNC became the government of Trinidad and Tobago by the PNM. And not only uh, were they pre-approved, the Minister of Works and Transport, who was in charge of that ministry, is the current Minister of Finance. I think the Prime Minister should address a number of his concerns as it relates to this project, the 0.410 Highway Project, 
to his Minister of Finance, where we have written evidence and proof that this project was evaluated and decisions taken by the then PNM administration in May of 2010. And they are the ones who chose, may I remind you, the company called OAS as the preferred respondent for the contract for package three. It is there in Nitco's records. So I just thought we should put that on the record and advise the Prime Minister to have some discussions with his Minister of Finance, who was then the Minister with Responsibility for Works and Transport at the Material Time. Is there any further question? If there are no further questions on this matter, may I sincerely thank the media, um, Akash Samaru, his team for being here, and others who followed it on, well, virtually for being here um, at this press conference this morning. We thank you for being here, and we look forward to you joining us shortly during the course of this week for another episode of our press conferences that we hold sometimes weekly and most importantly every Sunday at this venue. So thank you very much and reach safely to your respective destinations. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I too want to thank the media for joining us this morning at our weekly briefing. Um, I wish to thank the audience, both locally and internationally, for joining Senator Mark and I as we continue to prosecute matters affecting our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Your parliamentary opposition will continue to advocate for good governance in this country, and we will be monitoring the government every step of the way. Continue to tune in to our social media platform as we go along, as we attempt to keep you connected to the matters that affect you daily. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.